It's known as the golden hour. 60 minutes that are crucial in saving lives. But on this night in 2017, the wait for help took too long. At 10.31, the show had just ended when a bomb was detonated. Oh okay. There's a lot of people lying around on the floor. There's blood everywhere. OK, what's the address of the emergency? This sounds genuine. Please send ambulances. We're coming as fast as we can, OK? But the wait for ambulances took too long. Today, the public inquiry into the attack detailed what went wrong. The failings in the emergency response and the consequences including the conclusion. The delay meant survivable injuries became fatal for 28-year-old John Atkinson. He was left dying without his dignity on the floor when it should have been obvious to medics that he needed to get straight to hospital. As we know from witnesses, John kept asking if he was going to die. John must have known that he was dying and the pain that causes us to say that is too great to put into words. This should simply never have been allowed to happen. Those who have listened to the evidence will not be surprised that I am highly critical of many aspects of the rescue operation. Those criticisms must not overshadow our admiration for the courage of those who went into the city room without any hesitation to help the dying and the injured. The attack at Manchester Arena was the most deadly in the UK since 7-7. 22 people were killed. Among them was Philip Tron. His mother June was in the car, parked outside Manchester Arena, when she heard the blast. And you can't help but think how many of them may have survived. I mean, I know Philip couldn't have. It was impossible, his injuries. But I think there was others cut off. And I just think, why they didn't just go in? It was just, it was just a cock up. It's only me I can put it. It was just total. I don't know. The bomb had been built to kill and cause catastrophic injuries, with three thousand metal screws and nuts packed in with it. It was detonated near the box office, where parents were waiting to pick up children. In the train station below, people who heard the blast started to run in that direction. It's like a very loud bang go off. Evacuate your station immediately. Roger, I heard the bang trying to stop us what it is as soon as you can. It's happened by 107, it's definitely a bomb. People injured, at least 20 casualties. First aid kits were fetched. Some contained little more than bandages and plasters, not the tourniquets and trauma kit needed. Armed police parked up outside the arena 10 minutes after detonation and head inside to start their sweep of the building. A paramedic who had self-deployed is first on scene from the ambulance service at 18 minutes after the bomb. Police tell him medics are needed upstairs in the arena foyer. He triages the injured and is the only paramedic in the foyer until two hazardous area response medics arrive at Victoria Station at 11.14. By then, ambulances are queuing outside. But inside, they don't have stretchers. Crash barriers and ad boards are being used to carry people out. Sarah Nellist was at the arena that night. She was waiting in the foyer for her daughter and niece. She was eight paces from the bomb. Heat and fear. And the heat was something... It was just something I cannot describe. It was horrendous. Um, and then it blew me two metres from where I was stood. What were you thinking? What were you doing? What was happening around you? It was just carnage. And it was, you can't even describe. It was the smell. I, it was the soot up my nose. I couldn't taste anything. My ear, my hearing had gone. I just could, I, it was like, it was like an out of body experience. Like I was watching something else, someone like this happen to someone else. But with everything that you've learned, what do you now make of it? In this day and age, we've got the best emergency services that we've got. 
you just expect them to be there. You know, you, if, you, if you're in, in trouble, like if you needed to call the police at home, you'd expect them to come. That was a really big, worst thing ever. You just expect people to come no matter who you are, what you are, you're an emergency service. Well, Claire joins us now from Manchester Hall, where the chairman today delivered his report. Claire. Well, I think that description that we heard there um, of what it was like to be in the foyer in the moments after the bomb had been detonated gives us some small idea about just how chaotic and difficult it was in there. I mean, inevitably, there will be chaos when something like this happens, but... Frankly, the plans and policies and procedures that are in place are meant to reduce that chaos and not add to it. And to be clear, although the actions of the ambulance service were the ones that have much of the focus today in terms of the issues around survivability of some of the victims, the report that was published today makes it clear that this was an all-round failure of all of the organisations involved in responding. So we knew that firefighters took around two hours to get to the arena that night. Now, bear in mind, when you've got people being carried down flights of stairs on metal barriers, those firefighters could and should have played a crucial role. Police should have taken the lead. They should have been making sure that the organisations were communicating with each other. But that wasn't what was happening from the police, and everyone, it seems, was struggling to get hold of the police officer in force command who was meant to be communicating vital information to people. In terms of the ambulance service, uh, there was a, a reluctance, I would say, and a misunderstanding of the rules, according to the report published today. They regarded risk in a different way to other organisations. They were meant to all assess risk together on survivability because we know from the report today that the failings and the mistakes did have terrible consequences. John Atkinson, we're told, should have survived, but also there was Safi, an eight-year-old child. We were told she was very unlikely to survive, but there was a chance that she might have. Claire Fallon there, thanks very much. Well, in response to today's report, a press conference was held by the emergency services, a chance to recognise and apologise for those failures at Manchester Arena. It began with apologies, one after the other. Our actions were substantially inadequate and fell short of what the public have every right to expect. And for this, I apologise unreservedly. I want to apologise to the families of the victims and to every one of you affected by that terrible night. We let the families and the public down in their time of need and for that I am truly sorry. The failures they acknowledged a long and devastating list. Delay, poor communication, inadequate training and equipment. But they said in the familiar language of inquiries lessons had been learnt. Never again will we fall short of what the public should rightly expect of their fire and rescue service. I hope that the public will recognise that Greater Manchester Fire and Rescue Service is a very different organisation today to what it was in 2017. Convincing the survivors and bereaved may be difficult. Claire Booth's sister Kelly lost her life that night while you, they waited for help, Claire said she had to make a choice between helping her sister and helping her 12-year-old daughter. And she told the inquiry she learned a terrible truth that night, that essentially if you get caught up in a terrorist incident, you're on your own. We've heard a lot today in the report about the care gap. So again, we're going to take time to look at the report and make sure that those recommendations, and particularly the question you've asked around that care gap, that we see what more can we do to support the public until such time as emergency services arrive on scene. Today, first and foremost, was about those victims and their families, but it was also clear it was a difficult day for emergency services, forced to admit letting down the people they serve so very badly. Well, the Mayor of Manchester, Andy Burnham, also responded to the report today at a press conference, and he said this. 
to those injured, to everyone still struggling, and most importantly, to the families of those who died, particularly John's family and Safi's family. I wish to say this very clearly. You were badly let down on that night. You were entitled to expect much better from our emergency services than the response provided. And as you have heard from them today, everyone here is truly sorry that did not happen. Well, joining me now are Kim Harrison, who is the lawyer for the family of John Atkinson, who, as we've been hearing, would likely have survived had it not been for the inadequate response from emergency services, and Fegan Murray, who lost her son Martin that evening. I just want to come to you, Kim Harrison, first. The family of John Atkinson, devastating confirmation today that he might have survived if the emergency services had responded properly. What will they be making of what, what they heard today? How will they be feeling this evening? Today simply confirms what they started to realise all along as the inquiry process has unfolded, as they've been at the hearings, listening to the evidence, listening to the witnesses. They started to know something very badly wrong had gone with what happened to John that night and that the care he received um, wasn't right and had he had more timely medical care, he could have survived. And that idea that he might have survived must be devastating for them absolutely devastating. I think it's, it's almost impossible to put into words how that must feel. Um, I know his mum talks to me about recurring visions of seeing him lying on the floor um, once he's in that casualty clearing station, effectively bleeding to death, and that's an image that she can't get out of her head. I mean, Fegan Murray, one after another, the chiefs of emergency services stood up today and said, sorry, we made mistakes, we made terrible mistakes. How do those apologies weigh up against the enormity of the mistakes that were made? Yeah, um, so it may be a bit controversial, but actually I, um, I'm the kind of person to look, f I look forward rather than analyse what happened and what went wrong. A lot of mistakes were made, but my view has always been that, uh, you know, nobody enters the, the professions of police, fire service, emergency, any emergency services just for the glamorous hours and social hours and stuff. Uh, people enter those jobs with a genuine desire to help people and make a difference. However, mistakes have been made and those people who made mistakes know they have made mistakes and they have to carry that burden for the rest of their lives. And that can't be easy, but you know, obviously, those mistakes must never happen again. Well, on exactly that point, after apologizing one after the other today, they said one after the other, these mistakes won't happen again. If something like this happened, we'd be better prepared. Lessons have been learned. They use that language that we hear in these inquiries okay. all the time. What did you both think of that today? I think part of the problem is after the 7-7 bombing, when, when um, Lady Hallett did her, her report and recommended all the change, because all the mistakes that actually we saw happened at the arena happened then, um, we hoped that that would cause change. And, and, and actually, the, 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 the awful thing is that all of those mistakes were repeated at the arena. And, and so we have to get out of this cycle of making all the mistakes, spending a lot of money on the inquiry, brilliantly analysing all the mistakes and then doing absolutely nothing about correcting the mistakes. And I agree with Fegan, we have to look forward as well as backwards and make sure that, they, that those promises are actually implemented. But they're now saying the lessons have already been learned. Yeah, that's a phrase I really don't like. That's definitely inquiry speak. Uh, but, you know, to me, an inquiry, um, the purpose of that is to find out facts, what went wrong and, and how to put it right. And it always ends up in recommendations. So this time, I hope that the recommendations aren't just shoved in a drawer or on a shelf, that actually it was really good to hear um, Sir John saying that he will follow some of these recommendations up, and that's really reassuring. I mean, you talk all the time, you set out from the very beginning of losing your son that you wanted to be positive, and you set in train Martin's Law, this idea that all venues, small venues, would have to consider and cater for the risk of any terrorist attack. Now, the government have supported the principle, promised legislation in the last Queen's speech, and yet we're here we are. It is not yet legislation. Yes. Can you remain positive, given that? Yes, of course I'll stay positive, because it's my positivity that keeps me going. Um, but, you know, um, the government needs to realise that I'm not going to go away until this is done. Uh, and, yeah, um, 
the smaller venues need to be able to deal with Martin's Law rather than bigger venues who already know what to do and what to put in place. It's the smaller venues that are also at risk that need to adopt You've Martin's Law. You've five security ministers yeah. over the time that, since you yes. introduced this idea. Mm -hmm. Yes, I have, and, and the last one was really very nice as well. Uh, they've all been really, really supportive, to be honest. Um, but, yeah, hopefully now things are settling down a bit in government. Martin's law will progress. And Jim Harrison, briefly, you know, we see inquiries, we see reports, we see recommendations. How confident are you that these, today's recommendations will be put into place that will see change? That depends very much on, on the government, the Home Office and the response of people at the very top of all of the major emergency services. The, the, the report is meticulous in its detail. I think there are 25 pages of recommendations, far too many for us to go through on this programme. So it's all there laid out for them to do. They just have to get on, on and do it, but um, that's up to them. They, they have to do it. And obviously, you know, for all the bereaved, every day is difficult. Today was tough, presumably. Yes, of course. It's always really, really difficult, and, and it's re-traumatising coming to the inquiry, always. But you remember Martin every day? Absolutely.